Stellar Live, mission log number 270. If you feel whole and complete within yourself, and you're not needing another person to come to you to prove to you how lovable and loved you are, because you already are that, you already believe that, then you're going to attract another person to you that's whole and complete. And when you both are whole and complete, when you come together as a couple, then you create something even bigger than you can by yourself. It's called synergy. It's the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, meaning one plus one equals three. Welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Get inspired and live out loud. From love, freedom, and success to having it all. Here's your host, coach, speaker, and shining star, Orion. Roger, you're looking good. Hey, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Thank you so much for being here for another extraordinary episode about how to make your life stellar, how to make your life the best life ever. Burge Smith Lyons is the founder and CEO of Essence of Being, Healing Forest Foundation and the Consciousness Leadership Academy. For more than 40 years, she has helped thousands of men, women, children, and companies globally with emotional and spiritual healing, self-development, communication techniques, relationship, abundance, team building, and leadership development. Burge is an international best-selling author, motivational keynote speaker, channeler, spiritual healer, hypnotherapist, relationship, and communications expert. In this episode, we spoke about how to create a healing forest around you how to bring the right people into your life, especially when it comes to intimate relationships. And we spoke about your belief system and how the words you say to yourself affect your life and how to create that change that you always wanted. And now, without further ado, on to the show. Two, one, zero, zero. Hey, Burge, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Orion. I'm excited to play with you today. Thank you. I love that. I love play. I'm an Aries. (laughs) (laughs) So before we begin, how did you discover your passion? Can you give me a little bit of background of how did you get to do this incredible work that you were doing today? My story is probably like a lot of others. I was divorced. I was a single mom. I had a two and a half year old son and I'd lost everything. I went bankrupt. Uh, I was having a really bad time in my life and realizing that I kept asking God, why is this happening to me? I'm a good person. Why is this happening? I mean, all I had left to me was, uh, was a car with one headlight and one door that didn't open and I had to crawl inside the window to get to my child. Oh, wow. You know, that kind of a story where I just didn't know where to turn. And I was living in a van down by the river kind of a situation, you know, (laughs) and I kept thinking, why is this happening to me? Because I'm a good person. I was teaching workshops at at that time. And I felt like a total fake, you know, I was like, why? I'm teaching everybody about abundance and relationships and about communication and about loving yourself and all your subconscious beliefs, because that's what I was teaching children and adults and companies. But, and yet at the same time, all of this turmoil was going on in my life where I felt like I'd lost everything. And I realized that the reason why that happened to me or why I attracted all of that was so I could share my story and tell you that everything that I'm sharing with you now and all the things I've done in the last 40 years really works because I'm a walking testimony that basically, I mean, I have millions in assets now. I've taught on six continents, live workshops all around the world. I've taught thousands of adults and uh, kids, and I've built schools around the world. And I, my son graduated from NYU, and he has traveled around the world singing and dancing and acting, doing what he loves. And I have this wonderful relationship with my husband now of 25 years that is conscious where we have this, we've built a conscious community 
a global community of conscious leaders, empowering others to create a win-win world. And that's what I'm all about. And so I have a nonprofit and I have all of these things I've been doing all these years. But the reason why all of that started was because of what happened to me. And then I said, okay, I'm going to tell everybody how I did it, basically, where I went from where I was to where I am now. And that's what I share with people. That is incredible. I have a two-year-old. He just turned two like less than a month ago. We live on a lake (laughs) in a house though. And I can't even imagine how you got yourself from that place to where you are today. This is incredible, incredible. Like being a single mom to a toddler and, and, and doing that, like how the freak did you do that? Right. Well, I didn't give up on myself and I surrounded myself with people of like mind who reminded me of really how important and how powerful and that I make a difference in the world. And just to, it's really important to have a community or have people around you that support you in not just buying all of your crap. You know, it's like you go into this negative spiral, perhaps some people do. And it's really good to have positive people around you to remind you the real truth about you, which is that you are important and that you do matter and that you are making a difference in the world. And so I had a huge network of support and I attracted more and more of it as I went on. So it's really good. You can't do it by yourself. And that's what I call my our healing forest community, I guess. It comes from a Native American term. Healing forest is where you take a sick tree out of a sick forest and you nurture it back to health and you put it back into a sick forest. It could get sick again. So the idea is to create a healing forest around you. Not that I feel like any of us need to be fixed. Not that I feel like any of us really need to be healed because we truly just forget who we are. Mm. There's nothing wrong with us, but the concept is create a healing forest around you. Mm. It is so important to be a way to run away from toxic people, even if they're your own family, like limit interactions and, and, and be around those people that strengthen you. Tony Robbins, I heard him say that you're the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Mm -hmm. So who do you hang out with and how do they lift you up? How do they build you up? Because when you're in a place like that, where you hit a type of rock bottom, you need somebody to help you. You can, I mean, I guess you can do it on your own. You kind of did it on your own by changing your mindset and attracting the healing community. Right. And I realized, again, it was, it's all about your subconscious beliefs about who you are, because that's what I was teaching. And so I had to dive deep into, okay, what is it that I'm here to learn now? There, this is happening for a reason. But it's also connecting on a spiritual level, too, because to me, you have to have your emotional, your physical, your mental, your spiritual selves uh, connected so that you can better understand why you're doing the things you do so you can shift it. And that's why I bring all this subconscious stuff up for people, because a lot of times we're not even conscious of what our blocks are. We don't know why all of this is happening or why we've created what we have or how to shift out of it. And so that's why I really love working with people in that, because that's what's running the bus, the subconscious beliefs. You can do affirmations all day long to say, (laughs) You know, (laughs) I choose to be happy. I choose to be healthy and wealthy and wise. And I choose to have a great relationship. And at the same time, your reality might be showing you something different. And so how do you shift out of that? And so what we do is we look at those subconscious beliefs. Mm. How do you do that? How do you look at the subconscious? Well, there's a lot of different modalities on how to do it. One of the things that I always say is what's a clue is just look at your results. Look at the results you're having in your life, in relationships and communication in money in your purpose and your health, all of that, because that'll give you a clue as to what your subconscious beliefs are around that. And we can do a little exercise and play around to see what is in there to find out how people, maybe what's inside your subconscious around relationships or yeah, um, that's okay. My listeners, they know so much about me. <laughs> like if you gather all, all the episodes, you can really like 
take my profile, analyze it, and know, okay, I know who Ryan is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, this okay, is- let's do it. Yes. What do I have to do? Oh, well, okay. Well, first of all, let me just give you a little preface here that uh, intimacy means into me see, right? So mm, I like that. Being vulnerable is is key in order to have more authentic relationships and being able to communicate. And so being able to understand what your subconscious beliefs are, because it's sort of like, you know how relationships go, you pick, you may have a different uh, relationship, but it's very similar, same kind of patterns show up, same behaviors. It's like a different person, same person, but a different face. You know, it's like you can, you're the common denominator in all of it because people have different types of relationships. And then you can start seeing a pattern of, okay, I've attracted exactly the same kind of person to me to learn something. So I better learn it quick. And so what, what a lot of people try to do is they let, they let go of their desires because they feel like they're, they're stuck. So it's sort of like driving a car. If you're driving a car and you put your gas on, that's your desire. That's the kind of relationship you want to have in your life or what, what you want to do with your life. And that's your desire. Well, a lot of people are driving around with their brake on at the same time. And their brake is their resistance or the belief that you can't have it. Mm. And so what ends up happening is people settle and they say, well, it just isn't meant to be this time. You know, it just, this is the way it is. And so people drive around with their brake and their gas on at the same time and they spin their wheels and people feel stuck. Have you ever felt stuck? Never. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, what I, what I want us to do is play with this a little bit and say, okay, yeah. instead of letting go of the gas, which mm-hmm. is what people do, they let go of their desire and they settle, let's let go of the break and, and let go of the resistance or the belief that you can't have whatever it is that you want. And that will support you in achieving and creating whatever you want. And one of the ways of doing that is a great mantra that I want to share for everybody is trust and allow and don't ask how. <laughs> I like that. So if we can trust and allow and don't ask how and really understand that uh if we let go of the control of of thinking that if we try to change things without shifting our own beliefs then sometimes it's just not going to work out as well. So for things to change first I must change. So let's play for a minute. I just want you to do a stream of consciousness writing and what that means is that basically I'm going to say a statement and I just want you to jot down or think of the first things that come up. Don't edit it. Don't think about it. Don't try to figure it out. Just whatever the first thoughts are that you have. Okay. Okay. And then I need a paper. One second. Okay. So yeah, all of you out there, just go ahead and get your paper and pen and you can play along and see what comes up. We're going to dig around and poke around and see what's in there to find out perhaps what some of the subconscious beliefs that might be blocking you from really having authentic relationships or feeling more intimate and being able to be more vulnerable with yourself and others. And I know that trust is a big deal for people, but. Okay. I got it. All right. And then I'm going to give you this really cool thing we can do with this on how to orbit in love instead of fall in and out of love. We're going to orbit. Okay. So first thing I want you to think of is just write down the first things that come up. Um, In a relationship, women are supposed to be what? In a relationship, women are supposed to be, just jot down the first things that come up. You can write more than one thing if you want. And then. I would just do, we'll do it really quickly and you can take more time to do this on your own when you have a moment. Here's another one. In a relationship, men are supposed to be what? Men are supposed to be, just fill in the blank. And then. Again, you can go back to this and add to it to kind of dig around a little more. I've got two more for you. Mm -hmm. 
when I feel not heard, I, what do you do? How do you respond? And then the last one is, when I feel not seen, I, when I feel not seen, I, what? So there are so many others we can do, but in lieu of time, I just, and we can do other exercises like this and experiences in another session, but I just wanted to kind of give you a taste of what, so if you don't mind sharing, what'd you write down? Right. So the first question was in a relationship, women should be Uh themselves, strong, vulnerable, allowing goddesses, kind, playful. Perfect. What about men? Strong, they're present, kind, loving, sweet. And have you in your past attracted those types of men or have you attracted those types of women? Are you, have you, are you one of those women? Is that who you are? Are you describing me? This is who I am today and this is who my husband is today. But I had to do a lot of work to get to this place. Got it. I experienced an abusive relationship that was the, um, the catalyst to a major change in my life and me actually becoming a coach and becoming <laughs> uber empathic and becoming the person that I am today, attracting the relationship that I am today. But it was a, it was a journey. It didn't happen overnight. It was a lot of looking inside, peeling the, peeling the layers, working with the subconscious mind, working with God, creator, the universe, studying from actually the, the best of the best in the world, traveling the world. I mean, it took oh, <laughs> it took a while. Well, it sounds very familiar. Yes, that's awesome. And it fa- it's definitely, for those of you who may have some things in there that say, you know, these are the things that I want to have. I want to be that woman or I want to attract that man or, you know, depending on what your sexual preferences are. However, oftentimes there are blocks to getting there. So what did you say for when I feel not heard? Oh, that is something I'm still working on. <laughs> Okay. Because <laughs> when I feel like I don't, I'm not hurt, I'm getting louder or I run away. Ah. I don't like it. But it, there is also a part of me that is taking herself out of the situation and looking at the situation from kind of like a bird's eye view. So she will be able to be proactive in, instead of reactive. I see. So that's typical i will say for a lot of people when they don't feel heard you have two options you either go within and you become quiet and and run away or you get louder and i'm going to speak to this it's called an egocentric relationship cycle that you can get into uh, that i'll speak about in a minute but that is something that it's a defense mechanism for people. It's it's like either I want to be heard or if you're not going to listen to me, then how it lands on you is you're not important. And so that could be coming from this subconscious belief that feeling that I'm just not important enough for people to hear me. For me, I'll tell you exactly. I know exactly where it's coming from. And I actually discovered it last week. So last week I took a training from Marisa Peer. I think she's the best therapist in the world. And she does something that's called RTT, Rapid Transformation Therapy. You know, yeah. So I actually, I'm becoming a a licensed therapist. I just have to finish a few more sessions and I basically got my diploma. So it's hypnotherapy and through the hypnotherapy, you do some cognitive behavior therapy and neurolinguistic programming and some psychotherapy and you get to the core of what's, what is. And for me, I touched super deep, horrible childhood traumas. Uh, where I was not able to scream. I wasn't able to let my voice heard. And the belief that was formed was that if I am not loud enough, nobody's going to hear me or I need to be loud to somebody because I was a, a very young child and I was not able to voice. I, I Nobody was there to hear me. And even when I was screaming, nobody came to help. So, So that was the belief of like, I need to get louder. So that, so I can be heard. Right. And so feeling not safe is the bottom line there is like, I'm not, it's not safe for me to have a voice. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And if I have a voice, then I'm going to get hurt. So either A, I'm going to get hurt if I have a voice and get louder. Therefore, I'll just shut up and not say anything. That's another right. option, right? right? And so you become mute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Either mute or louder, like either or. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's perfect. Yeah. And that's exactly true that the, the belief system behind that is it's not safe to have a voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And feeling not safe can be a total subconscious belief that you don't even know you have until you do. And then you can shift it to shifting to uh, it is safe. It's safe to have a voice. And I am safe speaking. Right. And I have the right to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you create those affirmations without the base of knowing where they're coming from and not understanding, they, they don't have the same weight like me saying, I have a voice now compared to me saying that, let's say a month ago, not knowing where what was the, the core issue. It's different. It's not the same way. It doesn't have the same effect. Effect. Yeah. I understand that. And that's why I'm saying that it's so important for people to understand what their subconscious beliefs are and where they come from. So you, when you do shift them, it shifts it on a whole energetic experiential cellular way it's not just in your head Mm -hmm. yeah so perfect and what did you write down for when i feel not seen when i um when i feel not see seen i am making myself see be seen um i'm actually talking about physical like putting red lipstick and bold colors or or dressing sexier like i want to be seen I know it's superficial, but it helps me. And then I I see myself. I love myself more. I look in the mirror and I and I acknowledge not being seen and I see myself. Well, a lot of people, that's awesome. And a lot of people that are afraid to be seen, it's because of exposure. It means that perhaps if I'm seen again, I might get hurt because what you may have learned and may you may have had in your life evidence that the more I'm seen, the more I I either get hurt or I'm exposing myself. And so a lot of people, that's why, you know, public speaking and all of those types of things that people are afraid of, it's fear of exposure. Mm -hmm. I think I'm preventing myself from getting the success that I should get because I have that fear of exposure. But it's, it's based in reality. Just look at all the trolls online out there. And how people are mean just on, you know, on the social media platforms, like the more, the bigger you are, you're going to get more heat. You're going to get more love. And you see that can be a total block about you playing big because many people it's, it's a subconscious belief. I don't want to be that big or be that seen because of I'll be judged or I won't be safe or what are they going to think of me? And certainly because of all the social media right now and all of those types of things. And people will just play under the radar just enough so that they don't get hurt. Right. And so you're right. That can absolutely be a a perfect subconscious belief that now you are aware of and that you can raise that to the conscious level and say, it's safe to be seen because you, we all have evidence. We can look at the evidence and say, Hey, that's just the way it is. And that's the way it's been. You can find evidence for whatever you want. You just ask your your mind a question. It depends on the quality of your questions. You can ask, how can I not get hurt? Or you can ask, how can I feel safe? Two very, very different questions because your mind will answer whatever you're going to ask it. How can I not get hurt? Oh, just hide. Don't be big. Don't be (laughs) successful. Don't do anything. But, But how can I trust more? How can I feel more safe? How can I use my my God-given gifts to help humanity? You'll get a completely different answer. And I call that what you focus on expands. Whatever you focus on, it gets bigger. And it's called a reticular activator in your brain, actually. Mm -hmm. A real thing. It's not just a woo-woo kind of a, you know, concept. When you look for red, you will find red. You won't find the blue. That's right. And so that is what, so whatever you're focusing on, that's what's going to expand. And of course, 
that's the whole point is if you understand or you know now what your conscious level of your thoughts are, now you can, I call it pinch and shift. It's a technique where you just pinch yourself. If you ever find yourself saying something that maybe may not serve in you. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> But I mean, like, let's say that you just said, hey, I don't want to get hurt. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So you know that what you can do is pinch yourself. It's called a pattern interrupt. You pinch yourself on your thumb or your hand or your arm <laughs> somewhere because pain, it, it makes your awareness come to the pain. So it stops your thought process and you just pinch yourself and then you shift it. So let's say that you say something out loud or you hear yourself saying, you know, I should have done this differently. Or let's say you say something like, um, there's something wrong with me. And you know that that's not serving you when you say something like that. So you pinch yourself and you, and you shift it to, I choose to know the best thing for me. And change it from, if anytime you hear yourself saying, I should, or I would, or I could, or I have to, you can change it to, I choose. Mm. I use a pattern interrupt with my toddler all the time. Like when he cries, like I'll start singing or making a funny face or do something completely unexpected. And he'll just like, he'll look at me and he's like, oh, you're doing that thing again. Never mind. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> exactly. So it works the same way when you do a thought process. You can stop your thoughts and your beliefs right in its tracks. And they've proven this basically within um, two year olds. They did a study on two year olds at the University of Minnesota, and they they took a bunch of two-year-olds and they wrote down how many positive statements and how many negative statements were said to these two-year-olds within a 24-hour period. And on average, they would come back. And on average, for in 24 hours, these two-year-olds had 32 positive statements said to them. Not bad, right? Mm -hmm. Well, guess how many negative? 200. 432. Oh my goodness. Wow. Because that's what's happening when you're two. It's what why we used to call the terrible twos. Now we call them the terrific twos. But what's happening is you're becoming interdependent and you're saying, no, I'm not doing that. And you're not dependent anymore. And what ends up happening is the parents or the whoever's around those two-year-olds, they're basically trying to, of course, keep people safe. No, don't do that. Don't do that. No, stop, stop, stop. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. And so you hear all of these things, because all your beliefs are formed by the age seven. Mm -hmm. You know what? Like being a mom and knowing what I know, I just feel like I screw up all the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> like I should like just say like 420 positive things a day. Even even when just like last <laughs> night he ran into the wall instead of into a pillow and I freaked out. <laughs> well, let me just say, let me just say, mom, uh, that you have not ruined your child. And those of you out there... <laughs> Please forgive yourself for whatever you feel like you have or have not done, because guess what? We are all sentient beings and we all have our own paths. And what happens is we do the best we can, right, as parents and our parents do the best they can and our teachers and our religion and our TV and our culture. All of these beliefs come from all of those places. And so beliefs are handed down just like our genes are. Yes. So beliefs are handed down as well. And it's, it just, it stops with you. So you get to decide. Well, what is it called? Epigenetics when it's generational, like, see, like, like the same belief is there through seven generations or something like that. And, until it's not, you know, until you decide I'm going to shift it. So that's why it, for somebody who does not understand what epigenetics is, is for example, if, if one was a Holocaust survivor, their grand grandchild can still have a fear of not having enough food in their subconscious mind, which is not even their beliefs. Correct. And that's true for everyone, that everyone gets handed down your beliefs and it can be in that energy and your space, but you, you don't even know it because it's subconscious and you don't even know it's there. So that's why it's so important to bring it up to a conscious level so that you can shift it. And it does, you focus on exactly what it is that you choose to create. So this whole concept, I mean, this is, there's so many other ways we could do this, but one of the concepts that I just want to share with you around, of course, law of, everybody now knows about law of attraction and about what we think we create, but it's also about law of appreciation. There are a lot of different types of 
universal laws that we can talk about when we think of relationships and communication. But if you're not having a very, let's say that it's all about the gratitude. Let's say that you're not having the best relationship right now with your family members or whomever, whatever kind of relationship you think about one thing you can do is you think one, appreciate one thing about them. Just think of one thing. And what that does is it raises your vibrate, your own vibration of appreciation because appreciation is never wasted. Even if it's just as simple as they bring me coffee in the morning. And that's the one thing I can appreciate about that person. What ends up happening is they will either rise to that level of a, of appreciation. They have to rise to that level or it will go through that person and it will ping or hit somewhere else for someone else. And you will attract back to you appreciation. It may not be from the person you want it to be, and it may. But in either case, you get what you want. You get more appreciation back to you. Mm -hmm. My husband, yeah, my husband and I, we learned that from Harvard Hendricks. And every night before we go to sleep, we do a minimum of three things that we appreciate about each other. And they can be the simplest things, like thank you for telling me this or that or doing the dishes, something small, because our brain is wired to look for what's bad, to look for the saber tooth tiger, to look for what is missing. And the moment you shift from that old ancient program into gratitude, you look at the glass half full and you focus on what, what's good. And like you said, whatever, whatever you focus on, the energy will flow there. So you build each other up instead of breaking each other down I guess that's how you say it in instead of instead of depleting the relationship you are nourishing the relationship and it raises your vibration as well so I love that it, it, you attract that back to you so it, it's never wasted so I I agree because mm-hmm. when we start a relationship it's all hormones and pheromones and oxytocin and and all those good hormones and we just see what's good and then when that initial excitement is fading we have to put a lot into the relationship on a daily basis in order to have it grow. It's like a plant. You can't just look at it and expect it to survive. It needs sunlight, it needs water, and it needs it often and frequently. So people think, oh my God, I got married or I have a boyfriend. Yoo-hoo. That's just the beginning of, of a new phase and it never ends. You always have to give and receive just like you're breathing. You're inhaling, exhaling. You can't stop breathing. You have to breathe their relationship and and bring it life. Well, speaking of breathing life, many people have fallen in love, right? And then there are people who have fallen out of love. And so this is a perhaps a new way of looking at a relationship is orbiting in love. And what I mean by that is most people, whether you know this or not, when you get into a relationship, oftentimes the reason on a subconscious belief reason is we're coming to that person and we're saying, hey, please love me. Show me that I'm lovable. Please tell me that I'm a lovable person. It's called the honeymoon stage, right? Whenever you get in your first relationship, whenever you first meet people and you get together you don't, you're not thinking that consciously. You're not saying, Hey, love me so I can love myself. But subconsciously, we're asking that other person to prove over and over and over again how much you're loved and how much you're, what your belief is that you're lovable. Because what ends up happening, that honeymoon stage, we try, we try to give people something that they want. We try to make, quote, them happy, which we think that's what we're supposed to do. We try to, that's that falling in love part. But what ends up happening is it gets very exhausting to try to fill another person's hole, to try to fill another person's void, to say, I love you enough and let me keep proving this over and over and over again. But it gets exhausting after a while because guess what? They want the same thing. And so the whole concept of orbiting in love means if you feel whole and complete within yourself, And you're not needing another person to come to you to prove to you how lovable and loved you are because you already 
are that, you already believe that, then you're going to attract another person to you that's whole and complete. And when you both are whole and complete, when you come together as a couple, then you create something even bigger than you can by yourself. It's called synergy. It's the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, meaning one plus one equals three. So you have you and you bring that other person to you that's whole and complete and that's them, that's another person. And when you come together, it's a whole separate entity called us. So instead of contracting, becoming one, and it's very romantic. It's like, you know, uh, it's my other half. You know, it's my other, you know, when people say that's my other half or my better half, well, what does that make you a half person? So that's why people get devastated when someone leaves or if there's some kind of a mix up or there's a divorce or there's something happens, it leaves them empty. And it's like, who am I now without that other person? And that is because they've contracted instead of expanded. So the concept of this is perhaps a whole other way of looking at relationships is that one plus one equals three. There's you and there's me. And then together it makes us where we are something even bigger than we can be when we're by ourselves. But we don't lose who we are in the process. I like that. I like that a lot. And um, it's like what also for, for the single people who are listening, you know, it's almost like when you give up that neediness, I don't want it to sound bad, but there is some kind of a neediness sometimes, especially women come into the relationship or and saying to themselves, oh, the clock is ticking and I need to get married. And hello, how are you? Want to get married? It's like that that energy of like, I need you and I need you now. And this needs to happen now. And then people don't like that. People are scared of this type of energy. But when you come and you're like, I want you, I don't need you. I am good that is when you are becoming more desirable and more, more attractive to the other person. Right. And it's even, it's even deeper in that, like I said, most people don't even think about, it. you don't come to somebody, you don't just say, Hey, prove to me that I'm lovable. You don't come to someone and say that, but that's basically in essence, oftentimes why we get into a relationship is so that we can not feel alone so that we can feel like we are loved. And if we don't feel it within ourselves to begin with, that we can fill up our own self-worth and our own love for who we are and we're whole and we're complete, then it eases the pressure for someone else to fill that for you. And so it's not about just being needy. It's a, it's a, it's a belief that oftentimes we, we don't want to be alone. And so we don't feel complete without another person. And that's why I'm saying I make, you know, I make fun about, Oh, you know, what are you a half person? That's my other half, but it's really, a lot of us will do that. We tend to put our existence on other people and project our own worthiness onto other people or unworthiness. And so one of the best ways that I know to share uh, all of this is to say my strength lies in my vulnerability because the more vulnerable you become, the stronger you become. And it makes absolutely no sense. Logically, if you try to figure it out, logically, it doesn't make sense. But if you think about If you open yourself up, okay, and you have empathy, in order to have a compassionate relationship, you have to have empathy, respect, and ownership, meaning that you take ownership of your own thoughts, your own beliefs, and your own actions, that you respect yourself and others enough, and that you have empathy toward another person and put yourself in their shoes. And if you can keep that as a, as a basis for when you're in a relationship, that that becomes more of a compassionate relationship as opposed to an egocentric relationship, which means if you're a victim or if you are a rescuer or you're a self-protector, and that's where you're talking about in that reptilian brain, that brain that's trying to protect, right? So what ends up happening is in a egocentric type of relationship, you're becoming 
a victim is basically saying, I'm helpless. There's nothing I can do about it. And we tend to blame our partners or blame people for our situation. And what we do when we blame people is we're giving our power away. We're saying, there's nothing I can do about it because I'm a victim and I'm stuck. And the other part of self-protect, if you're a self-protector in a relationship, what that can look like is sort of like a blowfish. It's like you're going to protect yourself and intimidate the other person so that you don't get hurt. So you're self-protecting yourself and saying, let me intimidate you and let me be a bully so that you won't hurt me. Or the other way that you self-protect is you run and hide and you don't play. And then the rescuer is that that's the codependent. The rescuer says, I don't really feel good about myself, but I'm going to come rescue you. So that'll make me feel better about who I am. I'm going to, I'm a good guy. So let me come and rescue you. And again, that puts you into that egocentric type of, of relationship. So there's a lot of nuances about how to be in relationship and how to communicate from that perspective. And I think, I mean, there's so much more I could share about all of this and I have so many tools that I can give around it, but it's just to give you concepts. Those are some of the concepts of different ways of being in relationship. That's beautiful. Now to a different question. What are your three top tips to live in a stellar life? Oh, well, <laughs> I have so many. I have to do the top three, huh? About living a stellar life. I would say love yourself, trust and allow and don't ask how, and understand that my strength lies in my vulnerability. That's what I would say. And personally, there's so many more I could say about that, but definitely it's really understanding who you are, that you're important, that you make a difference and that you matter. And I feel like if you can keep that in the forefront of your thoughts and your actions, then everything will be okay. And I would say also take responsibility for your thoughts, your beliefs, and your actions, and don't blame other people or go into shame for things that you're creating because it really does not serve you to be in shame or blame other people. Because like I said, you become powerless when you do that and you can't change anything. So taking responsibility for your own thoughts, your own beliefs, and your own actions is key and it's it's a freedom i believe that's beautiful where can people find you and i also know that you have a, a gift for our listeners i do well essence of com is the name of the company that's i've been teaching this for 40 years essence of com is the site but i also have our nonprofit which is the healing forest foundation healingforestfoundation.org and uh, we're building schools in Africa with that. And also, I've been teaching in Asia and Africa and Europe and, of course, the U.S. and South America. But we're teaching children and adults these types of experiences so that we can create a, a win-win world. So, HealingForestFoundation.org is our nonprofit. And EssenceOfBeing.com is the main website for that. And as far as I have gifts for you guys and... One of them is if you text, if you're in the U.S., you can text 770-767-3848. That's 770-767-3848. And you put in the message EOB, which stands for Essence of Being. Then you will get affirmations for prosperity. You'll get a whole audio download. You'll get four free videos on how to create wealth. and that's one way. Another one is if you, I'm giving another gift, which is a more about authentic relationships. You can go to essenceofbeing.com slash R-E-L, which stands for relationships, essenceofbeing.com slash R-E-L. And that will give you a download on authentic relationships where you can get dive a little deeper into some of these experiences and these concepts. Thank you. That is beautiful. And I really, really loved our conversation. Thank you for the wisdom and everything that you shared and the, the gifts, so many gifts. Oh my God, it's like Christmas. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. 
You're welcome. I'm so glad, Orion, that we could play together today, and I look forward to playing again. Thank you. And thank you, listeners. Remember to love yourself. Trust and allow and don't ask how. And remember that your strength is in your vulnerability. Have a stellar life. This is Orion. Till next time. Thank you for joining me on my mission to light people up and change lives around the world. I hope today's conversation inspires you to step up, go after the life of your dreams, and be who you want to be. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to go to StellarLifePodcast.com for show notes, transcripts, and other cool stuff. And please subscribe, review, and help spread the word by sharing us on Facebook and Twitter. Have a lovely day, and I'll catch you on the next episode. Bye.